Okay, so we've had a sketch of a fusion reactor. Now I'd like to give you a little bit of a, of a brief history, let's just call it, of fusion and intertwined with that is plasma physics. It's all uh, quite inter intertwined, it turns out. Um, the first comment is that in the 40s, 1940s that is, uh, basically the fusion reactions were first quantified and you know people got an idea of what you really had to do and of course unfortunately the primary application of that was immediately the hydrogen bomb as opposed to a controlled thermonuclear reaction. On the other hand a number of the scientists walking, working in the hydrogen bomb projects tried to, dis, tried to come up with ways of making a controlled thermonuclear reaction so that you could produce a, a net power source. And so basically in the early 50s, there were the basic uh, ideas of controlled um, fusion concepts. Uh, the tokamak, and those included, by the way, then, uh, tokamaks, um, stellarators, mirrors, and so forth, which we'll sort of talk about in a little while. Just for, as a word of commentary, uh, mirrors were invented by a guy named, well, prominently by a guy named Dick Post at uh, Livermore, pushed a lot, uh, and a number of people. Um, stellarators by Lyman Spitzer and people at Princeton. Tokamaks, you might be interested to know that uh, the actual people who wrote the first paper were Andrei Sakharov, whom I'm, I'm sure you've heard of, uh, Soviet academician who was considered to be the father of their H-bomb and at the same time actually wrote the original paper with uh, Tom on how a tokamak might work. Um, generally speaking, people had so much enthusiasm for being able to do controlled fusion that they thought, as in fission, that really it was going to produce power that was going to be too cheap to measure. Uh, you know, it would just be so easy. However, of course, as I mentioned these experiments earlier, uh, capital costs have a way of getting a little bit larger than fuel costs. The fuel cost of, you know, imagining mining uh, deuterium out of seawater is not too big, but the capital cost of the plasma confinement scheme is really quite large. So uh, that was a, common, a comment in that area. The, the big thing, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention just pinches here which is just a matter of you just pulled an electrical current through a plasma and it pinched down and got very hot and dense and so forth, and that produced a great fusion reaction, hopefully. Well, the basic thing that happened uh, in the 50s, in the late 50s particularly, was things don't work. And the reason was, was because people really did not understand plasma physics, the science of being able to manipulate plasmas. And so it turns out they were, the plasma were grossly unstable. Uh, because they were unstable, they hit the wall, and they were um, impure, and there were all kinds of just problems, let me just say that. So it turns out that in the mid-50s, in particular in about 56, I believe it was, um, Soviet, and, oh, and by the way, I wanted to mention, you know, this is important, that the programs at that time, partially because they were a derivative of um, bomb programs were highly classified programs in both the Soviet Union, the United States, Britain, various other parties. Uh, in 1956, the Soviets actually went to the premier um, British lab and gave a talk on their fusion stuff, which prompted then people to realize that it wasn't just they in each of the individual classified countries who couldn't seem to make it work but everybody couldn't seem to make it work because they really needed to understand it and to develop the science. So the net result was in 1958, there was a so-called Geneva Conference uh, uh, sponsored by the International Atomic Energy Agency, Geneva Conference. And what happened then was that uh, uh, the whole program became declassified. Um, so there's... Uh, well, anyway, then in the 60s, what generally happened, so from then on, okay, it was declassified and has been from, uh, from that time on. 
So in the 60s, basically, what happened was that people began to develop <clears throat> very basic plasma physics ideas. And that went on mostly through the, the 60s. Then, as I mentioned, uh, in 1969, the Soviets showed that their tokamak was actually doing quite well. And basically, in the early 70s, most of the rest of the world adopted the tokamak as their prime plasma confinement scheme. And, um, well, anyway, so in this, uh, oh, and I, in this theory, in this uh, 60s, y you know, you would have a situation where the, the, the people working on plasma theory would say, uh, consider an idealized plasma with an infinite homogeneous magnetic field and a particle gyrating around the magnetic field. Very idealized theoretical models. The experimentalists would say, well, I've got this problem that uh, you, you may want a straight magnetic field, but mine's curved, and you may want a pure plasma, but mine keeps hitting the wall, and I've got lots of impurities. And, you know, you know there were a lot of developmental problems for a number of years. In the 70s, basically, a lot of the uh, plasma theory and um, and experimental technique um, developed, and so theory became sort of realistic, more or less, at least in linear situations. At least, meaning it could handle the realistic geometries. The experiments uh, became capable of uh, controlling uh, macroscopic instabilities, um, well, and, and getting relatively clean plasmas and developing diagnostics. And uh, basically, the experiments became sort of, let's call it, controllable. People could say, I want this kind of plasma, and they could put it together. And there were some correlations of theory and experiment, but, but kind of only a few and, you know, beginning to be. But there was good um, progress in uh, plasma performance. As I mentioned, couple orders of magnitude and ion temperature and confinement uh, in plasma confinement after the macroscopic instabilities uh, were controlled. Now, uh, also in the 70s, by the way, the inertial confinement fusion program, which I'll come back to in a moment, kind of got started up. And it actually started as, again, as a um, hydrogen bomb simulation program to a fair extent with a possible energy outcome, fusion energy production outcome. And so it, the inertial confinement part, has traditionally been mostly classified. There are parts that aren't classified, but anyway. In the 80s, there's been emphasis basically on increasing parameters. So toward this scientific break-even condition, which people feel you know, roughly with, within range of um, or in about the right range for studying the proper types of plasmas. Um, and actually, uh, many areas of um, theory and experiment are beginning to agree, um, namely in macroscopic uh, MHD equilibria stability, um, manipulating plasmas with magnetic fields, uh, having them, um, um, well, agree here, I'm putting in quotes, because pragmatically agree means to within an order of magnitude or so, uh, or I should say, I'm sorry, within, well within a factor of three, in some cases into tens of percent. On the other hand, uh, but plasma transport is a, a very, vexing issue still to this day, um, uh, and in many areas of trans, uh, plasma transport, we don't understand very well. So the plasma transport, not so much. Uh, and that ultimately is one of the, the key questions. As one looks forward, basically beyond this, so plasma physics as a, as a discipline and as a useful construct to try to understand and manipulate plasmas experimentally kind of came of age for the most part during the, in the basic areas, Landau damping, damping demonstrations, uh, et cetera, in the 60s, magnetic confinement demonstrations of, of good stability and so forth in the 70s, and now the issues are becoming more 
transport across the field lines, and detailed understandings of a lot of detailed phenomenology and reducing them to some extent to engineering practice or what in the business is sometimes called plasma engineering. So there's a lot of challenging problems that, that remain because a lot of these things are sort of roughly understood but not very precisely. Um, anyway, in the future what people talk about is maybe an ignition experiment, this demonstration of getting enough alpha particle, self-alpha particle heating in the plasma to achieve good confinement and so forth, uh, so-called compact ignition tokamaks or compact burning tokamak in the late 70s. Then because this program has began, began, been a declassified international program with a lot of international collaboration over the years, over the past two decades or so, um, or perhaps three decades, uh, there's a lot of international collaboration and working together, and the net result of that is that the, there's an a international team called ITER, International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor Design Team, made up of scientists from the United States, Europe, the Soviet Union, and Japan that works in um, Munich, Germany area, Garching, uh, by Munchenwirt. Um, they are designing an ITER reactor, which would be uh, come operational a little bit after the year 2000. Um, and that would be an experimental engineering demonstration type of facility. And then finally, people talk about a electrical power engineering, or I'm sorry, electrical power demonstration or demo facility sometime after about 2015 or so. So that's sort of the general uh, sense of flow. Um, and again, I can teach you about basic plasma physics only because a lot of that got developed in the sort of 60s and 70s. Okay, so let's go on to talk about plasma confinement then or in particular some comments toward plasma confinement. First thing I want to do is consider that we have, we need an ion temperature of um, about 10 kiloelectron volts. What's that mean? Well, one thing it means is that, the, is that the typical ion thermal velocity will be root 2 Ti over Mi, and then I always like to put in C C squared, MIC squared, and measure the uh, energy in, or the mass in units of rest mass energy. So this becomes 2 times 10 to the fourth EV, and the rest mass energy of a deuteron, let's say. Uh, so deuterons. Rest mass energy of a deuteron is then 2 times 10 to the uh, ninth EV. And then the velocity of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Well, that's the square root of 10 to the minus 5. So that's obviously just 1 over 300, approximately, 316, whatever. And so in rough order of magnitude, this is about 10 to the 6th meters per second. Or that's 10 to the 3 kilometers per second. Now, second is going to turn out to be an interesting confinement time. And so do you really want me to build a device, okay, to confine the plasma that's 10 to the 3 kilometers long? And the answer is, well, I kind of had something a little smaller in mind as a power source. You know, a typical power plant is not 1,000 kilometers on a side, right? I mean, you know, so we have, so basically we will need some form of confinement. We can't just let these particles free flow. Um, now, so then we need to talk about some approaches to um, controlled fusion or actually confinement. So let's talk about approaches to confinement for fusion, plasma confinement for controlled fusion. Well, one approach that works extremely well, anybody tell me, is basically the sun, right? The sun, it's perfectly happy to go more than, you know, 10 to the 3 kilometers, right? So let's just say the sun does it well with 
gravitational confinement. And actually, deuterium tritium is not so much what you get as the burning reaction, but you get many proton reactions, a number of other, a number of, well, a, a large number of other light nuclei fusion burning reactions. But they're all, um, but they're all some type of uh, fusion reaction. Um, so the sun does just fine. Now, uh, let me talk about some that don't work. Uh, so some that don't work. at least for net power. Um, one is that we could run tritons or you know, blast tritons into a deuterium target. Um, now it turns out this is used for, this is how you get a 14 MeV neutron so source. So let's say used for 14 MeV Neutron source. Anybody know why it doesn't really work as a power source? Yeah, you remember that we said a minute ago that I need that I had to have, I had to hold the particles for a hundred Coulomb collision times per to get one fusion. Well, you know, I run a triton into a solid target typically, and I get all scattering and only one, one out of every hundred tritons that I inject fuses. And it turns out you go through all the energetics and you just don't make it. Okay, So uh, it's sort of too, too little fusion per scattering. And actually mostly what happens is that the triton in going in um, hits all of the lighter uh, electrons and just jiggles them. Now there's one way that you can improve upon this a bit, uh, and that is you can do something called mu or muon catalyzed fusion. When we have an electron orbiting around a charged ion, like a triton, then you know that it stands off at a distance of about an angstrom, Bohr radius, 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. But if I replace that electron by a muon, which is, you know, 180 times heavier or so, uh, that, you know, collapses the size, the effective size of a triton plus muon atom to be much smaller root, sort of, much smaller than the triton electron system. So if I'm much smaller, then it requires much less uh, energy to overcome the Coulomb potential barrier. And as a matter of fact, you don't even have to hardly overcome it. You can overcome it by getting particles only within that distance. The only problem is that, um, so muons can catalyze or make much easier uh, fusion, DT fusion, but at essentially with zero threshold. They make the threshold energy zero, roughly speaking. Now, this sort of, in some sense, enhances the DT cross-section, but the problem is that you turn out to need about 200 uh, fusions per muon because it's kind of costly to get muons, right? I mean, I get, have to get those by breaking up some heavier particles, and that costs me a lot of energy. So if you go through the energetics, you find out you need about a two, uh, 200 uh, fusions uh, per muon. And what you do is have a cold pressurized DT gas that you have all this happen in. And people have achieved something in the range of 70 to 100, but they think that it's just not really possible in a cold DT gas to have that happen. Uh, so, that, but that one's kind of not totally out of the running, let me just say it that way. Uh, so-called cold fusion is not, which was a bit of a flare this past year, uh, but in fact nobody can tell if it's really fusion at all still, uh, was a play on this to a certain extent in the thought that if you uh, injected enough deuterium uh, and perhaps tritium 
but DD was what they were really hoping for in that case, into palladium and could pack it close enough in a crystal or in a lattice type um, uh, configuration that the nuclei would be close enough, at least in a statistical sense, to achieve some room temperature fusion. In fact, that's not uh, been really uh, validated, uh, or at least it seems to be scattered validations, which some people can repeat and some people can't. So it's generally not considered to be serious at the moment. Uh, another type, as you can imagine, I could take a potential or an electric field and confine particles. But, you know, we got this problem that one sign of the electric field will confine one type of particles, okay? A positive potential will confine electrons, a negative one ions. And so, basically, this only confines one group of particles. And you could say, well, I'd be satisfied with that, but over what distance would you be satisfied with it? Uh, the answer is... Uh, you would have to be satisfied at, uh, over um, uh, less than a Debye length, right? And Debye lengths, you remember, we've been talking about are 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3 centimeters. So that wouldn't make a very big plasma, and you wouldn't, or plasma, a set of ions, say, that you were interacting, and you wouldn't get very much uh, fusion power out of it. Another one is electromagnetic wave pressure. Remember, we had a ponder-motive force. We said, well, gee, there's this uh, energy density in waves, and if we had an energy density in the waves, and we push on the plasma with that energy density, we might be able to confine the plasma. And that's a possibility. The problem is that, generally speaking, too much energy, remember, there's a little bit of collisions in a plasma, just a little bit of collisions. And so there's too much energy is typically dissipated in the, um, let's call it the edge plasma interface. You know, you have in mind you have the electromagnetic de energy density here and the plasma energy here, but there's got to be an interface between them. And in that interface, there's too much resistivity of the plasma, and you dissipate an awful lot of the energy in that re uh, rate, um, region per unit fusion you get out of such systems. So uh, we're kind of run out of time today, so what we're going to do is stop here, and next time we'll get to the real uh, approaches to fusion, controlled fusion, which are being worked on seriously, namely first so-called inertial confinement and then magnetic confinement. We'll do that next time.